I would rather be dead than to lose his love. Especially after so many years of watching his hand move in my life. You know, when I was first approached some years ago to be a part of the Seventh-day Remnant movement, I, was a, I must be honest, I was a bit skeptical at first because I've, I've seen it all. Well, quite a big chunk of it all. And however, though, after meeting with some of the people of this movement, I saw what I can only describe as a group of real Christians who had the exact same desires that I had, which is to see the Lord glorified, to see his ter- return expedited, and to see many souls come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior in this dying world. And as I look back over the last few years since joining, I see that, yes, I made the right choice. Many souls have come out of Babylon, many souls have been saved, and many have been healed from everything from disease to demonic possession. And yes, I have seen some with evil agendas come to attack us as well, because as hard as, as this may seem for some, that, that's part of the job of being a follower of Jesus Christ. So it's like a no-brainer. It's going to happen. But as I look at, uh, uh, I look around today, we can see that some of us are being lured away from our first love. And this tears at my heart deeply. Or as yet it tears at the heart of our Lord. If we allow Satan to have any control in our lives, no matter how small this control may be, appear to be, he has us right where he needs us. If he has just a foothold, he will hold on tight and use it against us at the exact moment that we are at our weakest, because we gave him permission to. The only time Satan feels threatened and powerless is when God's people allow the Lord to guide them with even the small steps and not him. If we really want to strive on to perfection, as prophecy says, is to be the remnant's heart in these last days, then we have to start getting very serious about our walk. Everything from tithing to turning off the TV is going to have to be the norm for us now. We have to be 100% obedient now more than ever. And if this is something you feel you cannot do, then ask your brothers and sisters in Christ to pray with and for you. To edify each other is a basic fruit of this church in the first place. This is what we're here for. It's not just a piece of the message to all the people of the world that don't understand it. It's to help each other do it. So look around. We see the mainstream news speaking about aliens. I mean, think about this. Mainstream news now, like CNN, is speaking about aliens from other worlds as rock-hard truth now with actual military eyewitnesses that have just come forward on September 27th of this year. This is something the Vatican has been preaching for hundreds of years. They even got paintings in the Vatican with UFOs in them. One of them actually shows Mary being impregnated by a UFO. So they're up to something here. There's also an article I just posted this week on the website wherein scientists are suggesting a skull of a deformed child that was found 80 years ago. Back then, though, they said it was just a deformed child. Today, they've got rock-hard proof. Now it's an alien-human mix. We see large resorts, and I'm working on a video about this right now, a four-minute video. Large resorts that are being built inside mountains, in caves, and deep underground, hundreds of feet underground, and then they're literally advertised as the top places on earth to ride out the apocalypse. That's the headline. Best places in the USA to ride out the apocalypse. We see the Antichrist in Rome flexing his muscles right now in the laws of the land for 175 out of 192 nations on earth. I mean, how close do you want to get it? Well, we also see sins that used to be done behind closed doors, not only being done in broad daylight now, but they are done on TV sitcoms and popular movies and novels and as if they're absolutely, positively the real meaning of life now. So much so that Facebook and other social websites display them proudly like it's, it's no big thing. Everybody does it. We see the, harboring, uh, the harbinger of the plagues looming all around us from bloody waters and billions of dead fish to strange occurrences on the sun itself and toxic tsunamis rushing through cities in Hungary. This just happened this week. It's, a, it's like a six-foot red wave that if it touches your skin, sears your flesh instantly. If it touches your eyes, you're blind permanently, instantly, burns right through your clothing, and it rushed through all these towns in Hungary, and then it ended up in the the, the Danube River, and and now it's headed for the Black Sea. We see earthquakes in hundreds now of places, well, 
you know, all over the world each and every week, hundreds of earthquakes. We see hailstorms in tropical regions where it literally takes bold, tropical regions, mind you, where it's hot all the time. It literally, and I got pictures of this on the site in one of the articles, it took bulldozers to clean up all this hail. Bulldozers, it got so deep. We're actually seeing tornadoes in New York City. As old as I am, I've never seen that ever in any city, but it happened in Dallas a few years ago too. And now we see, we got strange lights that are spiraling in the sky that are being shot from, from the ground and they're given all these excuses as to what they are, like missile tests or whatever, but they're, and they're literally being filmed and they're on YouTube uh, happening over Norway and Canada now suggesting that the tools by which they are going to be able to pull off a fake alien vis uh, visitation or Maitreya visitation using holograms are primed and ready if they want to do it. We have daily TV shows making ghosts appear to be real to the masses. You got the ghost whisperer, you got uh, John Edwards talking about people that are, you know, they've been dead for years and he's telling people all these secrets that they, you know, because the demons are talking to him and telling him what their secrets were. But no one, oh no, there is no such thing as demons, you know. Everybody believes in ghosts, but they certainly don't believe in demons. Amen, that's the UFOs are demons. So whether they can't, if they can't get the demons to show up in one place, they use a hologram because they already got the technology now. Churches the world over are sanctioning, including the Vatican, giving the thumbs up to movies and novels like Harry Potter. What was the last prophecy to happen before Jesus gets here? The last prophecy was, besides preaching the gospel all around the world, which is happening now, the last prophecy was spiritualism was to explode in our day. And now little kids are reading Harry Potter as, 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 as if it's factual. And if you don't think fiction comes off as being true to people, explain the Left Behind series. The Left Behind series is fiction. The guys even say it's fiction, but yet everybody uses it in churches now as if it's gospel. All this malarkey about a seven-year trib and the 666 on the forehead and all this stuff. And to top it all off, we've got guys like Chris Angel and all these other so-called magicians out there walking on water, floating in midair, and performing magic tricks that would make sorcerer Simon Magus envious. How much more evidence do we need that we have to get really, really serious about our walks? After all, as students of his word, are we not completely aware that we are just visiting this planet with all its sin-filled attractions so as to better ourselves for the future eternal life our God has promised us? You know, when Pharaoh asked Jacob how old he was, what did he say to him? <laughs> I thought this was amazing. It's because I'm, oh, I just finished Genesis, now I'm going into Exodus, but just, you know, I remember that like about a, you know, a month ago I was reading in Genesis, and it's in Genesis 47 verse 9, it says, And Jacob said unto Pharaoh, the days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. In other words, I'm 130 years old. That's what they would say today. Few and evil have the days of the, of the years of my life been, and have not attained unto the days of the years of my life of my fathers and the days of their pilgrimage. The word pilgrimage is defined as being a stranger sojourning in a strange place. The word sojourn also means to reside temporarily, while at the same time it also means to reside for a lifetime. So even if we stand on this planet for a lifetime, it's only temporary that we're here. We are just pilgrims. Even our God himself agrees with that definition. When he was speaking to Moses right before placing the plagues upon Egypt, he said to him in Exodus chapter 6, verse 4, I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. So he's double defining it there. As Christians, we know we're only on this planet temporarily because our real lives are eternal in the kingdom of our God. Jesus said in Matthew 6, verses 19 to 21, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, where thieves do not break through or steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If we hold onto that which the world has to offer with a white knuckle grip, we are blunt, bluntly declaring to the Lord, we love that which we have here more than that which he has prepared for us there. That being the mindset, why would he want us in his kingdom? 
if our heart is here on earth, then here we will stay with all the wicked that will die on this earth. Remember, we have free will. He is a gracious God to give us that which we truly desire. If we truly desire the world, then the world is where we will remain. But his people are prophesied to leave the world and enter into that city. Are they not? Some Christians of the world have not the ability to lift a trial, the weight of a feather in their time of trouble, even though our Lord has boldly declared we can move mountains in Matthew 17, 20. Jesus himself said, if you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, I mean, it doesn't even take much. You shall say, he said, unto this mountain, we'll move hence to yonder place and shall remove and nothing shall be impossible for you. And I remember the first time I read that I'm thinking, well, why would I want to move a lump of dirt? I took it out of context. But then when I saw situations in my life that were like mountains where I could not move them or even budge them, I understood that he was talking about amazing disasters in life or whatever, things that you know that there's no way that you, mankind, or anybody that you know, like even if you got a bunch of Christians together, they couldn't get it to move. Only Christ can do that if you have the faith of a mustard seed. Those of us that are struggling to trust him have to start taking him at his word. Signs are all around us declaring the precious, I mean, the turn of our precious Lord is very, very close. Prophecy says we, the remnant people, are to do a mighty work in these last days, and unless we start turning off our favorite TV shows, radios, or putting down the cigarettes or glasses of wine, we can never hope to see even a small trial, the weight of a feather, be uplifted in faith. Since it is prophesied for us to do this work, why wait to prepare for something we know is not only prophesied, but inevitable to boot? For those of us that are still asking ourselves, how do I do this work for the Lord? I have to say, it's not all that complicated if you have faith. But for the sake of illustration, if there is any sin in your life whatsoever, and of course you are reading the Bible every single solitary day, but if there is sin in your life whatsoever, then like Peter, walking towards Jesus on the water, you're going to sink. We're all going to sink. Those footholds, Satan has in our lives right now will be displayed before us at a moment we least expect it so as to bring doubt into our hearts when we pray. For example, how many of us feel unworthy to pray after we've seriously done something wrong, even if it's a little pink, little dinky little sin? Satan reminds us at this time of unconfessed and unrepentant sins so as to make doubt rise up in our hearts. How can we pray to the Lord for a spiritual blessing of any kind or a payment of a bill, no less, or a soul saved, or even an answer to a question that's been on our minds for years with an unrepentant sin in our lives. This is how sin works against us. Satan gets you to fall for his temptations so that when we need to pray, our faith will fail miserably. And he doesn't care that, you know, um, you're not going to have this crazy situation where you're going to need to pay, pray for years. As long as he gets that foothold in there and keep you in that foothold, he knows that when that event comes where you're going to have to pray, oh boy, he's going to throw that foothold up there and say, look at this, look at this, look at this. You can't pray. Even if you do, it's, not, it's going to fall on deaf ears. You're useless. That's what he's going to do. Now, if we have such footholds, we know are wrong in our lives, we still have Satan whispering deep in our minds that we won't have an answer to our prayers because we've sinned. No matter how tiny it is. This is why whenever someone asks me why I refuse certain things in my life or in my home, I tell them it's because I like having my prayers answered. If I know of any sinfulness is being allowed in my life or in my home, I have to remove it as best as I can, and then I can go into prayer without doubt. Truth is, Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 23 and 24, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there remembers that, thou, that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled unto thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. It's just like with communion, too. Next week we're going to have communion here on the 16th. And you have to, you know, if you have any sins in your life, you've got to get rid of them before you, you, you I mean, you go, that's, that's, that's a big no-no there. We'll, we'll discuss that next week. If it's